We're happy to see you back for what happens to be our 189th episode of Think Tech for Wise Human Humane Architecture. In our continued search to check on more tensegrity for our tropics, we're broadcasting live from uh, both ends of the world. One me in where uh, Mr. Uh, tensegrity Fry Auto had one of its most prominent projects, the Olympics in 72 and to Tucson, Arizona, where his collaborator and friend, uh, uh, Larry Medlin is. Hi, Larry, good to have you back. It's nice to be back. Uh, let's jump right in where we ended last time with this first slide here, because uh, very emotionally we ended when we uh, last saw each other in 2014, you had moved on and we're able to see Fry one last time before he passed away then the year after and got the Pritzker Prize, well-deserved. But we want, before we leave uh, you know, Stuttgart, his, his place where he was heading the Institute for Lightweight Structures and had his firm nearby, we want to show here how his uh, work is, uh, is lasting uh, in its impact, right? And we're looking at Stuttgart, uh, 21, which is currently under construction. And uh, our uh, previous guest, Ulf Meyer, who we had on the show way back, and we want to have him back to talk about his expertise of architectural criticism and the importance of that. Um, Ulf had been working from Christoph Ingenhofen, who, was, uh, who is the architect. And uh, right now, the, uh, the executive engineer is who I had the chance to have in school as my structural professor in Hanover for a year, who was Werner Stoback. But the initiating engineer and architect uh, was, in fact, by Otto. And we see him at the very uh, bottom left there, pointing out the initial, the initial sort of tensile uh, project here. And, and it reminds you a lot, Larry, of uh, your guys' pioneering days, right? And explain more in detail why. Well, right after I left Germany, I was invited as a guest at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where Buckminster Fuller was. Uh, and there I was exploring with salt films, explaining some of the principles with the students. And then I was showing them how to make salt films and how to do it. and then. Uh, I turned it over to one student and I said, you know, play around with it for a little bit. And one of them said, well, well, what if I lift one side up and pull the other side down? I said, well, let's try it. And he did it and it made a very interesting form. So that was done literally in 19, at the time, it was 19, late 1967. And then at Washington University of St. Louis later, I had a chance to build an experimental membrane structure, which you see in the top row with the pictures of, of the design model. And then on the left-hand slide there, you see a photo of that axial structure there. And that was sort of a, a, an idea that was developed further from that point in Fry Auto's development of the project that we're just talking about, which will serve as the new train station in downtown Stuttgart. Exactly. And I was just watching um, a, a video from the client where Ingenhofen gave a talk and we, it's, it's actually been executed in concrete, which is a little surprising. And again, uh, Fry, as we kept talking, not afraid of uh, constructive discourses, basically was also a little bit critical of the project after the fact, but it, I think it also shows that you know, how much bigger this idea is and that it can inspire indeed you know, structures in different embodiments and different, uh, different materializations just as well. And again, uh, him, his, you know, his legacy living on even or particularly in, in his city of Stuttgart. But let's move on and go to the next slide because as he, as we're uh, showing here, his work has not just stayed in, um, in, in his home country in Germany, right? What are we looking at? Which other parts of the world, Larry? That's the uh, the temple in the middle of the garden in Mecca there. They're, those are made out of one foot by one foot stained and painted glass tiles. Yeah. So that's in Saudi Arabia and in Riyadh. And um, already at the conference that you were attending, 
he had someone from that region sitting next to him, which we cropped out and put at the very uh, top left. And yeah. we're looking at another continent at the very bottom, right? Yeah, that, that's a conceptual design he did of the, one of the first actual sort of use of the space net concept as a structural element. And that was a proposal for uh, a pavilion for the country of India. And the idea was that it would be taken from town to town and set up and re-erected it in different places. And it would be a place to display cultural artifacts and historical artifacts and stuff. So it was a way of inside of in, in India to introducing all the sections of the country to the, the interesting variety and the variations and the dimensions to its own culture. Absolutely. But the other main continent in the world, the United States of America, and let's go to the next slide. He basically continued to leave to guess to whom, to you, Larry. He already started that as we were talking about when he was invited for the MoMA for an exhibit. And he basically said, well, you, Larry, do it because it's your country, it's your culture. And so to be continued. So one of the first projects, when you went back, we see at the bottom, right? Explain what we're looking at. But we're, we're looking at actually uh, three different images of projects right there on that slide. The one at MoMA, which was manufactured by Peter Strohmeyer. And then uh, afterwards, I had to uh, find a way to get them man manufactured and done in the United States. So the large picture, is the Crown Center Plaza. And that's actually a, uh, uh, the same conceptual form as the high-low model that we talked about earlier that, that was a basis for the conceptual ideas for the German pavilion. And, and this is in Kansas City, Missouri, and it's uh, two pieces to the pavilion. It's two 75 foot by 75 foot squares to make a, in, in this case, they're put together to make a 150 foot square. And the interesting thing that these also show is those were a vinyl coated polyester materials there, and they were intended to be uh, portable so that they, they kept them up for nine months of the year, but they could also put one of the pavilions on the upper plaza and one of them on the lower plaza. So it gave them a chance to plan in many different ways for different cultural events. And then the upper right is a slide of the Adaptive Recreation Center in Tucson, Arizona, which is uh, 30 years later. The, 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 the previous slide was made by Walter Byrd, but I had to go and talk to him in, in Buffalo, New York. He was famous for doing his radar domes, and he knew how to use fabric and had a great vocabulary and awareness and many samples of fabric materials. So that was made of vinyl coated polyester. And then the, the rains in the 30 year period or 40, almost 40 year period to the one in the Adaptive Recreation Center. And that's a Teflon coated fiberglass material. So the, the vinyl coated polyesters will last depending upon where it is and what the climate 10 to 12 years. And, and theoretically, the tough one's supposed to last 30 to 40 years. All right, and let's look at some more of your applied researches, Larry, and go to the next slide, which first gets us at the very top left uh, to the place you continue to stay where you are broadcasting yeah. from, from your Tucson, Arizona. And yeah. that was around the time when you started there in the mid seventies, right? Uh, no, in the mid seventies, I was at Washington University in St. Louis. Oh, you still were. Okay. When so, uh, when did you start in in Tucson again? Then? In nineteen seventy three. Okay. But, All right. Okay. But the, what, the slide that we're looking at on the left that also shows the 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 duration for which you can use materials. Those are just simply uh, polyester stretch fabric material, and that's used to stretch out and cover an alley. A north south alley with the high buildings on each side. So, those shade structures not only provide shade for the area there, but they also keep the sun from being absorbed by the masonry mass of the adjacent buildings and the asphalt on, on the pavement. So, that 
it was possible in midday in Tucson, Arizona, to have a summer Mercado underneath there and sell things. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a temporary structure like that. And then over on the right, the blue structure, that that was a project done for the uh, uh, National Endowment of the Arts, sponsored that for new performing environments for symphonic music. It was at a time when physicians were going from you know, part-time employment to full-time employment. And the arts foundations were interested in finding ways for them to do things outside the venue. So this is one of several concepts that we did. This is a St. Louis County governmental plaza. That's a, again, a polyester stretch fabric. Uh, it's a deck and the county plaza that's up with a parking garage below. And so uh, the, mo the day before that show, uh, windows were open and cables were tied outside of the building over sandbags and down tied underneath to the deck below. And then from that, that blue thing was suspended and that was put up and literally there for a day or two. So it's a portable structure that could be used literally uh, as a part of a cultural facility in any place. And uh, you, you said the conductor liked it because it's swinging and swinging in the wind was just in line with his choreography, right? Well, that's right. And, that, and, he, and then he asked me, did you intend that? And my answer was, yes, maestro. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the thing that works very nicely there is there's an arcade behind that. So that's an acoustical resonating chamber. So sound is projected out there. So it works very well with a natural acoustic. Yeah. And you also didn't shy away from, uh, you know, having your expertise applied to commercial structures like malls. And let's zoom on to the very bottom left. The bottom left is, is an interesting firm. That's the Yuma Palm Shopping Center in Yuma, Arizona. And it's right on the border between Arizona and California. And This is a mall that runs literally at, at, uh, from sort of southeast to northwest, and it's at an angle. But you can see it's got shade structures all the way along that with intermittent cool towers that provide cool air and spaces. So uh, you always have the choice when you're walking in that mall, or walking in the shade or walking on the more shaded side or the more sunny side. Mm -hmm. And The middle row of pictures uh, gets us back to Tucson, right? Yeah, that's that's the uh, Northwest uh, uh, Community Center in the, in the Flowing Wells area. And what we're looking at there is a courtyard with landscaping in, with a lot of vegetation, and then these shade structures that are oriented. So we're the, in the bottom picture, what you see is how what the high overset sun, sun, summer sun sees. It shades most of the area. And the upper one is how some of the sunlight gets through it and the, and the openings in between in the winter when the sun is lower. But the advantage of that structure, it made it possible for all of the, the activities that surround that courtyard to be glass facades because again, It's shaded not only from the direct sunlight at the time, but it keeps the area shaded so they could open and close sliding doors to let activities and all of the things on the four sides move in and out of that plaza. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And as we also see in all of them, you're bringing color to it, right? As one of the new things you've been adding to. They've been monochromatic a lot before that, and you're bringing color to them. Also, which is to the one that, that's left at the very bottom right, which is this sort of, you know, reusable kind of adaptive structure, right? That, that, that's the Arizona Spirit. That was an exhibit designed for the University of Area Centennial in 1985. And there you see it. That's when it was, I think, in, in uh, Pine Top, one of the rural areas. It traveled to every county fair, uh, the state fair, Shopping centers in Tucson and Phoenix. It was on the U of A Mall, exhibited twice. And what that was, a travel company lent us a van, and that van was, provided a support structure 
And so when we got to a place that, that provided a place to put vertical posts, and then we just unfurled from that, the, the, in that case, a stretch fabric, a shade structure, and then it was nailed down with posts around the perimeter. And that had different modes of areas around it. It had exhibits about items at the university, it had a performance stage, it had, you could go inside and make uh, electronic contact with the university. It, on one side, it had an exhibit about the history of the university. So it was meant to be able to communicate to the citizens of Arizona what the University of Arizona was doing and what it was doing with both its teaching, research, and service. Mm -hmm. And so and we're going to see in one of the next slides how that same structure was reused. Yeah, let's, let's go there. And again, just make sure you, what we've been talking about the previous projects you've been doing with Fry, they were in tempered Canada and Montreal and equally tempered Munich, Germany. Here we're talking hot air, right? And you told me that here on the ground without your interventions, it would have been or was 140 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That's like what, 45 degrees Celsius or so. That's a event in 1987 on the Phoenix Civic Plaza called the Solar Oasis. The slide, it's the same infrastructure, the same, but this time it's a permanent vinyl coated polyester tent that's used there. It's oriented to the south, so a little bit of low winter sunlight would get through. And then warm air rises up and vents out the top, so you always get a nice breeze through it. And the downward or restraining curvature direction follows the arc of a high overhead summer sun. So that with the two cool towers, which are the devices with a evaporative cooling pad that draws in natural air and drops cool air and floods the space with cool air, two zones. And that allowed people to use that in the middle of the summer when it was all 110, 15 degrees. Use it in the middle of the summer, even to go there and eat lunch and view activities in the summer by reducing mm -hmm. temperature that way. The bottom two slides show an aerial view of the overall of that and one of the elements on the right. Yeah, absolutely. And the cooling towers, by the way, you also always used to do with the students as one of the first projects they ever did as to you know get them sensitized about their very specific climatic conditions you always had them you guys always had them build a cooling tower but you just didn't uh you know leave it with uh you know designing for for human beings but also for animals and not that far away a little further west on the uh on the continent of the united states uh, you've been building in LA for birds. And let's go to the next slide. And so, let's look at the, uh, the top project first. The top row is the children's zoo in, in, in Los Angeles. And we designed a series of different enclosures. And what you see here is the model of the enclosure on the left and the actual mesh material on the right. It was a mesh material because this was, was for small birds and so they could fly into the mesh without becoming injured. And we also did, you know, chain link materials and other things for different kinds of enclosures. We even went to a one inch by one inch chain link so that we could provide safety in a more secure environment for animals that had claws or things like that to provide check uh, protection. Mm -hmm. And then there are the condors you designed for at the bottom, right? That, that's right. There was a, uh, Cal uh, California condors were almost extinct and they're a very important bird, uh, bird in the ecology of the desert. And there were only uh, 20, uh, 25 left in, in existence and half of them were put in a facility at the Los Angeles. Los Angeles Zoo, which is this, which I'll explain in a minute, and the other half in the zoo in, in the San Diego Zoo. And the, the reason we got this project was that we, we realized that if, if you think of a chain link fence, it's just a long, literally stretched tensile band. And so they wanted this facility uh, to be 
first of all, it was in a part of the zoo that was available. It was a back part, and it was a very steep hillside. And that was a desirable circumstance because uh, when the condors were in there, they could fly in what was a series of six flight pins. And, and the, but when they weren't flying, they could walk up and down hill, the hill so they'd develop their pectoral muscles and, and be much stronger, you know, more athletic so they'd have a better chance of, of surviving. And, and, the, and the reason we got this job, which was also a, a design project with T.A. Cade, which is a, a design build project, with T.A. Cade, which fabricates items all over the world and is excellent at doing things like that. So we, we prefabricated these components. And the way we got this built was we took chain link fencing strips and draped them up in the air. And then we uh, cut channels down to, to the earth and, and then dropped chain link dividers in between that. So we literally built this pavilion from the sky down. And, and the, the, the logic, the way it works is up at the top is a series of blinds. Those are places where the scientists observe the contours. The reason they're painted, painted black is so that the contours won't see their own shadow and get spooked. And then there's a series of nest box down at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. Now that program has been very successful. Uh, they keep on na nature shows and things. I just saw a program where there's a, over 500 uh, co healthy condors now, and they showed a series of slides of how they're breeding naturally in remote areas in the various parts of the desert and on all throughout the Southwest. Thanks to you. Kudos to that. And we, we put in that little picture of, uh, of Fry Otto's aviary in Munich up there. And, and again, your, your work is a continuation of that. On, on your continent. And that gets us to the next slide, which is the beginning of a, of a larger um, uh, research um, publication that we wanna talk about. And to put this into perspective again, we throw in the little two slides quotes from the past, you know, just reminding us how you both had been kicking off so amazingly having had the chance so early in your careers to build one of the most important typologies that you can think of um, a world's fair pavilion. But um, again, uh, if we look at the little picture to the right, um, we don't want to forget that you reminded us that Fry very early in which we call his little um, Ber Berlin Bauhausian box, he was already investigating in, in much bigger things and basically, you know, um, in, in whole communities in whole neighborhoods. And, and this is what you then, you know, immediately after returning from having been so successful with, with, uh, with design building uh, a real thing and large scale and, you know, been shown to the world, you went back uh, together with your students and did studies how you, how you can apply that to larger inhabitation for the many people in need, right? And let's talk about that, that a little bit Tell us the context and then also tell us what we look at at this sort of suggestive illustration. Well, we, we, this, these were done at Washington University in St. Louis. They were done basically from 1967 to 73. And there was, it was actually two studies. One was a architecturally conceptual model of how you could build a space net system and the image is a suggestion of how it might look on a, a, a real site that we made it work into and, and test it. And we'll see images, more images of that later. That's what this image shows. But also to test that, we built a physical test structure where we actually built a real space net. And that was also built on the, uh, the campus part of the University of, of Washington University in St. Louis. And it, uh, it was for us, it was an experimental structure, but it was also a vehicle for uh, an arts fair and a festival and exhibits of various items in and around and about it. But it allowed us to actually physically build a space dead experimental structure that was about uh, 60 feet long by about 30 feet high. So it was big enough to really 
test some of the principles and ideas at, at close to full scale. And then this, this, uh, this part was actually done after the experimental structure. And so this was showing how you could take some of those ideas and develop them to a, a real permanent building and what the detailing might be. And also architecturally studying about how you could you know, solve all the architectural problems of various types of units and adaptability over time and those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. We're almost at the end of another exciting 28 minutes, but let's go to the next slide really quick to phase out because this is a very methodologically uh, manuscript and let's quickly touch on the basic principles on tensegrity here in, in these diagrams, well, Larry. Yeah, you see that that's all those members pulling out of the cubes up above that, that creates a, a square that's the only stressed in tension taking advantage of there's no bending or buckling in tensile members. And then on the right shows how you extend that to a network. So uh, the series of slides are sort of on, on the left. You're seeing a series of how it's a linear structure like this golden gate bridge on the left and then a pre-stressed bridge where there's a counter cable. So that's a pre-stressed one dimensional tensile structure. The Dulles Airport is a two-dimensional uh, non-pre-stressed. And then the German pavilion was a pre-stressed tensile membrane. And then the same in, in physical buildings. There's a hanging or suspended building in Canada on the left. And then there's the space net concept that we developed and as, as shown on the right. And in the series of right the slides on the right are just showing some of the form possibilities for how you could use that to create different architectural volumes and shapes and so forth. Yeah, and, and how that can be applied to the these days even more urgent need um, of housing uh, the little people we will see uh, in, in the next show. And until then, we want to uh, thank uh, you, Larry, of course, and uh, our host, Rob Paulus, and his studio. Uh, in which you're sitting in. Thanks for your generosity in, in having us. And uh, yeah, um, until next week, Larry, where we're looking forward to see you again. Um, you guys all stay uh, increasingly tropically pensile, right? Auf Wiedersehen, Martin. Viel Spaß und Swishen. Dankeschön, Larry. Bis nächste Woche. <laughs> bye bye.